Welcome to Getting Sketchy Live, brought to you by thevirtualinstructor.com. And now, let's get sketchy. Hello there, everyone. How are you doing? Matt here with virtualinstructor.com, and welcome to Getting Sketchy Live. This is season three, episode three, and what we try to do here on Getting Sketchy is either myself or my good friend, fellow art teacher, Ashley Hurst. We try to create a drawing within 45 minutes from start to finish. And that's what we're gonna be doing tonight. We're gonna be uh, drawing a lovely little bird uh, with pastels. We're gonna be working on Canson pastel paper. Specifically, we're gonna be working on Canson Mitant's pastel paper for this. Uh, you're, you're welcome to use any type of paper that you want. The pastel paper has a little bit of tooth or texture associated with it, which we'll talk about in just a minute when we get into the materials that we're gonna be using. But first, I'd like to welcome Ashley for, for joining us tonight. Ashley, how are you doing over there? I'm doing great tonight, Matt. Thanks for that welcome. And I'd like to welcome Judith, Michelle, Trevor, Maria, Ivy, Alexis, and Alistair, and everybody else out there in the chat. I'm looking forward to talking to you this evening. Absolutely. Welcome to one and all. And if you are watching this live on YouTube, there is a chat box, of course. You can post questions and make comments. And if you put it in all capital letters, that will help Ashley see it a little bit easier since Ashley's going to be manning the chat box tonight. So you're free to ask any questions that are art related. It doesn't have to be about what we're talking about tonight. Of course, it'd be anything art related. And myself or Ashley will try to answer those questions for you, of course. So welcome to everyone. Now, uh, I should tell you that if you're new to this channel, I would encourage you to subscribe uh, and make sure you hit the bell notification so that you get updates when we post new videos. We cover a broad variety of drawing and painting media and subject matter here on this channel. And subscribing to the YouTube channel is absolutely free, of course. Uh, we also have a fantastic membership program over at thevirtualinstructor.com. In fact, when we're done here, uh, right after getting sketchy at eight o'clock, we're gonna be broadcasting live over at the Virtual Instructor for members. Uh, we do longer series over there as part of our live lesson series. And right now we're working with watercolor pencils and tonight is the last lesson of this particular series. So I'm gonna be finishing up the drawing that I'm working on and I'll show you where we are so far in the process in just a minute when we switch over to the main camera. If you wanna check out our membership program, there's a link in the description below this video. And you can also get on our mailing list and check out three of our course videos and eBooks for free. There's also a link below this video to check that stuff out as well. But don't do that right now because right now we're ready to get sketchy. Ashley, are you ready to get sketchy? I've been sketchy all day. <laughs> Let's do it. I've been sketchy my whole life. Uh, so <laughs> I can attest uh, this to that. should come naturally here. So let's go ahead and switch over. All right. As I mentioned, uh, I was going to give you a little bit of a sneak peek of what we're working on for our live lesson series. This is not what we're going to be doing tonight, uh, but this is the series that we've been working on for the last few weeks. You can see we've all we've got left really to do is the branch here. We've been working with watercolor pencils to complete this image, and we'll be finishing this up tonight. Is uh, this the seventh lesson tonight? I think so. I think, I think so. I think it's the seventh lesson. So, uh, so you know, all of our live lessons are recorded and they're stored in our vault. So uh, they, that goes all the way back to 2012. So we've been broadcasting for eight plus years. Wow. I can't believe that. Uh, I remember when I first started doing live lessons, there were there were like maybe one person. There I want to go back and look at the early ones just <laughs> well, to see the, how different you may look. <laughs> oh man, eight years ago. Oh man, um, they have changed dramatically over time. Um, some of the earliest live lessons actually have been removed because the quality was oh, wow. just so bad. I mean, that was you cut them. That was 2012. I cut them. Yeah, I just I couldn't have them out there because the the Call it, it was 2012. Mm -hmm. I mean, who was streaming live in 2012 besides me? I mean, yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, so the anyway, early days. Yeah, and the quality had to not be that great because... It was what was available, really. It, right, exactly. So anyway, um, let me get this out of the way, and I'm going to try to put it in a location where there's not going to be pastel dust flying everywhere, which might be a little bit hard to do. Now, um, this is the paper that I'm working on here. This is Canson Mitant's pastel paper. Here's a look at the package or the pad this uh, particular sheet came from. I love this paper for working on. It is pretty inexpensive. It's a wonderful surface to work on. In fact, there are two surfaces. 
like all paper, has two surfaces, but this <laughs> paper features two distinct surfaces. Uh, the surface we're gonna be working on here is the smoother of the two surfaces. This still has uh, a fairly good tooth or texture associated with it. And when you're working with a material like pastel, you want to have some texture associated with the surface. So the pastel dust d doesn't just go everywhere. Uh, if you've ever worked with pastels uh, with like a smooth, regular drawing paper, the dust goes everywhere. Um, so the heavier the texture, the more the pastel is gonna stay in place. And an added benefit uh, to working on a heavily toothed or heavily textured surface is you can layer more applications. So the surface is going to accept more of the material. And with a medium like pastels, which is really dependent on layering, you really want to have a surface that does have um, a, a bit of tooth or texture associated with it. Uh, this paper, of course, as I mentioned, has two sides, and we're using the smoother side, as I've already covered. There is a heavier textured side, and normally I would use the heavier textured side, but since this is going to be a quick sketch, I'm not going to be able to put all the layers that I normally would put uh, in a pastel drawing, and I want to build up a solid application as quickly as possible. So I'm working mm. on the, the smoother side, but both sides are perfectly acceptable. And this pad had lots of different colors in it. I'm only down to a few sheets left in this one. I go through these pads uh, pretty quickly here. So we'll get that out of the way. Um, and I am working on kind of this earthy orange surface here. Um, and really the reason for working on this particular surface um, first of all, it gives you a tone to start with, and I want the drawing to feel a little bit warmer. So having a warmer color underneath the applications that I apply to the surface is going to help with that. And there's a lot of blues that we're going to be applying to the surface, and the blue is going to contrast uh, this really nicely. So let me go ahead and bring up the uh, reference image here so you can see the little bird that we are doing here. Now, all right. <laughs> This image came from Pixabay, and I have edited it, of course. Uh, basically, what I went in and did is I cropped it down. This was a pretty big image, and the bird was kind of small within it. And I also bumped up the saturation of the colors to a really, really, really high level um, because I really wanted to have a lot of color information there. Uh, so I tried to pull out a little bit more of the blue and the orange there. Now, this bird, this poor bird, looks like it only has one leg. I imagine the other <laughs> leg is up behind the body. I'm probably going to add a second leg here just because it feels a little bit awkward. This works fine for a photograph, but in a drawing, it's going to not translate that, that same way. It's going to feel a little bit awkward. So I will more than likely add the second leg. Now, uh, we're going to be loose with this, and I'm going to take more of a painterly approach to create this drawing. Um... So let me get my photo reference out in front of me, and then I will set up the timer. How are we doing over there, Ashley? Got any so questions did you there? mention this was a, a robin? Um, no, I didn't. Well, um, Libba mentioned it's a robin, so congratulations. We believe it's a robin, too, though we're not sure exactly what kind. Did I? Did we talk about that before? Yeah, did we I did say talk robin? about it a little bit, and you told me that. And I, I mentioned to Matt, it this doesn't... Look like the robins I'm used to seeing. I can't seeing, remember. So. Did I say robin? You did, did say, say robin. Something? Oh, good yeah. for me. Matt I, doesn't usually get this kind of stuff right. Stuff comes out of my mouth, <laughs> and I don't remember ah, saying it. It's a European robin. A Euro I see. That's it has an accent, mm. um, and so do we. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on where you're at. <laughs> all right. I guess I better bring up this timer here. I, I'm all. I got my photo reference in the wrong place. There we go. That's that's better. All right. So 45 minutes on the clock and then we'll get right into it. All right, so I'm gonna start here with a pastel pencil. I forgot to mention some. I'm actually gonna hide the timer. Not because, <laughs> not because I'm cheating. He doesn't want us um, to see how long he's gonna take. <laughs> I forgot to talk about the materials. I think I'm last be week he here. had the timer turned up, and I was only getting 45 <laughs> seconds out of every minute, I and now there is up. no timer. Yeah, I sped it up. Ashley didn't know. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm gonna be using a couple of pastel pencils here. These are... Uh, Carbothello pastel pencils. I've got a dark brown, I've got a black, and I've got a white, and I've got kind of a middle coolish gray. I don't even know if I'll use this, this gray. I'll definitely be using these three pencils here. I'm going to be starting with the, the brown to basically sketch out uh, the basic, basic form of the bird. Uh, then I've just got an assortment of colors. I've kind of limited my palette here. Uh, on what colors I'm going to use. All of the round pastels that you see in here are Rembrandt soft pastels, and then I have some new pastels. New pastels 
are a little bit harder than soft pastels and they're not as chalky. So they're a little bit better for detailed work. And um, there's some colors in my new pastel set that aren't in my Rembrandt set. And I've got, I don't know how many Rembrandt pastels. I've got two huge boxes of them. Mm, they're fantastic. Um, but some of the colors are that are that I have with the new pastels are not with the, the Rembrandt pastels. And your new pastels, pastels the, is a smaller set? Yeah, oh yeah, mm. much smaller. I think it's only 24. Yeah. So, uh, 24, 48, something like that. So anyway... Uh, these colors do have proper names, but I'm just going to refer to them in terms of color theory when I'm grabbing them, like uh, a light orange. That um, We could call this a burnt sienna, I guess. So I'll do my best to to name them based on their actual... Based on what they look like. Right. Because you exactly. may not have the same named pastels in your set. Exactly. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I will bring up the timer now. We do have a question already All while right. you begin. Libba asks, how are pastel pencils different from normal wax pencils? Well, wax pencils have a wax binder, and uh, pastel pencils have a gum arabic binder. So uh, this is pastel material, and the wax-based colored pencils are colored pencils. Th mm -hmm. This is not a colored pencil. Right. This is, it is a, it's a pencil that has color but it is a pastel pencil. And I have a post that has uh, that lays down the differences between all of the different colored pencils out there over on the website. If you go to the blog and just uh, just search for comparing colored pencils. Oh, that's nice. Uh, you'll, you'll find that because there are a lot of colored pencils out there, but only a few are actually colored pencils. You got watercolor pencils. You got uh, water all kinds of graphite. pencils with with color in them exactly. that are not that are not color pencils. All right, so I'm going to start here with the bird, and the first thing I want to do is kind of get the angle of the body. So I'm just going to kind of make a note of that, and then I'm going to start up here with the head and try to get kind of the slant of the head, and then going down the back here. So we call that angle line you put in first the gesture of the bird, just the general direction it takes through space. It's important to capture that first. So e each time I make a mark here, I can kind of compare it to that initial mark and make sure that I'm kind of keeping this bird at a, at a slant. He's going to look a little weird, or she's going to look a little weird if I don't have that angle going on there. It'll lose a little bit of its dynamic property. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, an, it's a nice because the bird leans a little bit in one direction, and then the, the slant of the branch that he's standing on leans in another direction, so it's not too static. Got some nice diagonals in this in this composition, as simple as it is. And I'm keeping things super loose. You see how loose this is? I'm moving my arm, uh, trying to keep keep the pencil moving, trying to find, find the bird here on the paper. I like to remind myself that the, the first pass, the first go around, most of those marks aren't going to be part of the finished drawing. They're going to kind of dissolve and melt into the pastel. So not too much pressure. Don't put much pressure on yourself with your first marks. And these marks definitely will dissolve into the pastel applications. So, All right, totally looks like a bird now. There, there it is. <laughs> it looks like a lot of things right now. We could play a guessing game. All right. So, for example, this outer edge right here, um, I can go ahead and clean this up a little bit with a needed eraser just to, to help you see it. Uh, you can see I've kind of made it in a little bit of an adjustment to the edge of the wing there, and it needs to kind of come in a little bit right there. But I don't, I don't need to get too fussy with all of this here because I'm being timed. Plenty of time. Right now there is. <laughs> And get an indication of where this wonderful little beak is and where the eye is as well. Starting to look more like a little bird. Mm -hmm. All right, now I'm going to smooth out the edges of the body just a little bit. All right, the guessing game started. Of course, now that it has a bird, I mean, now that it has a beak and an eye, it's clearly a bird. But at first, maybe it looked like a bean, squashed bean. I thought it would look like a collapsing mushroom, but uh, no longer. Collapsing mushroom. 
All right, just giving myself a little indication of where we have that contrast between the orange sections and the bluer sections. All right, we'll go ahead and bring one of these legs down. All right, we've got a little update from Laura Rainbow Dragon about the species of this bird because it is so different from the robins that we're used to seeing here in America. This European robin is related to, is not closely related to the American robin. They're actually different types of birds. Laura Rainbow Dragon tells us that the American robin is a thrush, and this type of a robin is an old world flycatcher. Oh, okay. I always love the supplemental information mm -hmm. we get here. Learn something. I should actually all the time. find subject matter that I know nothing about so that right, I can learn we'll, about it. We will learn about yeah. it for sure here. All right. So. And um, you'll see during the process, I'm going to try to make this bird maybe a little bit more angular than what it is in reality, just to make the image a little bit more interesting. All right. Art Plethora says, if you don't have pastel pencils, what can you use instead? Well, you know, you can draw with any materials that you do have. If you're, you know, if you prefer a, a color medium, you could use colored pencils. They may go a little bit slower. Um, you know, they tend to lay down a thinner mark and maybe lettering goes a little bit slower, but you could use colored pencils and still, um, and still benefit from the information that Matt's going to share about his, uh, his color choices. Yep. You can use anything like Ashley mentioned. Anything and if you just wanted to you. make a, a charcoal drawing or a graphite drawing, you know, this, uh, this image has a great value. The background's very light. The light on the bird, the where the light is hitting the bird. Those are nice mid-tones. And then we've got some shades underneath the breast of the bird. So the whole value range is there. It would look really, I think it would look really good as a uh, grayscale image as well. Yeah, that's what I was going to su suggest, actually, charcoal, um, since... It would feel like a pastel a, uh, drawing. Yeah, it's, it's similar. Um, but you can see here, now I'm switched over to adding the color. And I'm just going to first initially block in... Uh, the colors of the main areas that I see. So I'm still thinking basically in terms of shapes here, and I see that there's the big orange orange section up here. I've been told that I, I say orange terribly wrong. It should be orange. <laughs> orange. Orange. I'm filling in the orange section here. That feels so weird to say that, but I guess that's correct, right? Because you don't... Oh, orange. Orange. I say orange. That's well, probably not Do you right. say either, I mean, you know... Either either. Are you a pirate? Nor. The, the person oh. told me, he said, are you a pirate? And I said, no. And they said, well, why do you say orange? <laughs> so, uh, I guess you're right. Uh, that's a good point there. We, we, we've talked about pirates on the show before. So we do have an affinity for pirates around here. Are we going to go there again? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, just going to put in the, the base color of orange, orange. And there's a little bit back here on the wing. So I'm going to just put a little bit down here real quick. And now we're going to go on to our blue. And I'm actually going to start with maybe a lighter blue-gray here first. So again, just, just thinking in terms of shapes of color. And you can see how loose and quick this is. I don't know why. I didn't even think of it. Um, Rick, uh, Rick Ricky, I hope I said your last name right. Mentioned uh, oil pastels. That'd be a great. Oh, yeah, that'd, that'd be, be a great alternative mm -hmm. to just to the regular chalk or uh, traditional pastels. I don't mean to say chalk pastels. Please don't get angry. It's not chalk. But uh, in any case, um, yeah, oil pastels would be great, and they're a lot of fun and look great on toned paper, especially black. You know, it's not chalk pastels, but they are still referred to as chalk pastels. Yeah, they feel by like, a lot of people. They feel like chalk, but they do have a binder. You know, it's not just. They're not just compressed. So even though this area down here is dark, I'm still just simplifying it down into what we're going to call the blue area for right now. We do have a question from Trevor. I struggle with picking the best color of paper for background. Any tips? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't overthink it. Uh, a lot of times people just overthink things like that. And um, I wanted this background to be warm. And the or I wanted the color of the paper to be warm because I wanted the image to be warmer. This is just kind of a darker brown here, um, and that's why I chose this 
orange paper, and I knew it was going to contrast really nicely with the blues. You can see how much it's contrasting with the blues right now. So that's really the extent of my thought process with the paper. <laughs> yeah, don't overthink um, it. Just try some different uh, some colors, maybe some dull and some brighter color, and see what feels good for you. See what looks looks good to your eye once you start drawing on it. I typically go for the darker, cooler um, shades, I guess, and neutral colors. I really like black paper, which isn't the color at all. But the colors are brilliant um, compared to it because it is void of all color. Okay, now I'm going to bring in some of that brown over the top of our blue section. Just start getting some of these darker values in place. And you'll see here, this drawing is going to go through lots of stages and um, it's going to be really dependent on layering. So as we continue to layer these applications, I'm not, haven't blended anything yet. Hmm. Um, and I also want to point out here that I'm working on a flat surface. Ideally, you want to be working on an, an easel or at least an elevated surface so the pastel dust does not stay right there on the surface. Yeah. But uh, because of my camera setup and the way things are, I usually just work here on the flat surface. Um, and that means that I have to do things like this, pull the pastel <laughs> dust away. And I know that uh, that is going to cause some of you to freak out, but uh, <laughs> I'm not breathing in the pastel dust. He blew his pastel dust and his COVID-19 straight at me. So <laughs> that we did. <laughs> I do not I, have COVID. I do prefer my pastel drawings to be totally vertical. And, and the, you know, it makes a mess in the tray on your easel. Um, but it keeps your surface nice and clean. We do have some questions flying by, so I better catch up there. Um, Pat is interested in classifying the pastels as much as me. Would it be correct to name them dry pastel? I actually like that because I like to think of media as being wet or dry and then have subcategories such as hard, semi-soft, and soft. I, I, I would prefer to say dry pastel personally over chalk pastel. I don't know that it'd be more, more or less correct. I think probably the correct designation is soft pastel. Yeah, soft. We'll go um, with that. The, for for this for, for what I'm using right now. Using for right the, now. the new pastels, they might be considered hard pastel. Maybe. Yeah, I would call those hard pastel for sure. <clears throat> okay, so um, you can see now I'm block, blocking in a next color field or color area uh, of green. So basically, what I've done is I've just started with a loose sketch of the subject, and now I'm blocking in just basic colors. And don't overthink these basic colors either. Um, I just kind of picked a, a generic yellow green here. You do want to avoid greens that appear unnatural, which there's a lot of unnatural looking greens out there. Mm -hmm. So you have to be careful. Usually the yellow greens kind of tend to have more natural appearance. Maria asks, can you sketch in pastel and then move on to oil pastel? Because I noticed that you can erase the pastel. I would not suggest mixing soft pastel and oil pastel. I, I consider oil pastel and soft pastel to be two extremely different mediums. Yeah, yeah, I concur. I mean, they, they can look very similar. They have that, you know, they come in larger sticks, so they have kind of a loose feel and um, very bright colors. They mix well on the paper, but... Not with each other. Not though. with each other. I would think of them as one being wet and one being dry. Oil pastels and the way that they are applied are um, the, the techniques you use with oil pastels. It's going to sound a little bit strange, but they are somewhat similar to colored pencils. Um, and the fact that you have to think about the colors that you layer because they're not going to cover over previous applications completely. So you do have to be cognizant of the colors that you're adding as you're adding them. Where with these soft pastels, I can be a little bit more liberal uh, because if I if I have an area that I don't like, I can just cover it up completely. Mm -hmm. Where with oil pastels and um, colored pencils, you can't really do that. It is worth, you know, you did mention that you can erase the pastel. And um, when if you do need to erase oil pastel, you can't really erase it, but you can scrape it down back to the paper with a with just a razor blade. That's what I use. You can still see the color stained on the paper, but um, in that in that way, you can totally cover at least the stained area so that you're not getting that uh, incidental mixing that Matt 
was referring to. Now, I got a great question here from Joan McDonald. When you are layering, are you using a lighter touch? Uh, not right now. Right now, I'm putting a pretty heavy touch, the uh, or a pretty heavy pressure on the pastel. The only exception is when I went over some of these areas with the darker brown. Uh, I did loosen up a little bit and I did or lighten up a little bit with the pressure. I didn't put as heavy pressure on those those applications. Now so, the new pastels are harder, and some people use those. First, I mean, you can, you could use them together, but I've known pastel artists that will go as far as they can with the new pastels because they're harder. And then when you switch to the softer pastels like Rembrandt's, it's as though you're using a lighter touch because they come off, come off of the stick a little bit more easily. Yeah, that, that's true. These, whenever you want an intense application of color, you're going to want to use the soft pastel. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So now we've got our base applications down. Now we're ready to start pushing the color and adding a little bit more depth to things. Um, so we're going to continue layering. Now I'm going to grab a little bit of a darker green. I'm going to start with the background here. And I'm just going to add a little bit more variety here and there. I'm going to keep my marks pretty loose. But you can see there's kind of some darker greens and uh, some lighter greens in here. So I'm just going to enhance a little bit of this behind the bird. And we'll actually probably end up coming back to the background at the end again. Well, he's looking good. I do like how Thanks. I just, I like the edge quality of the whole bird. feels like he's just landed or about to take off. Got a little bit of well, vibration, a little bit has, of vibration to him. <laughs> it helps that the poor bird has two legs. <laughs> Okay, so up here, our values are going to be kind of lighter. Uh, back here, they're going to be kind of darker. So I'm actually going to try to make this edge up here a little bit darker with the green. And I'm looking at the greens I chose, and this is it's actually the darkest green that I have. Hmm. <laughs> Might would have made that a little bit darker, but it'll, it'll be okay. And I also want to point out that I still have not blended anything. Other than just what the pastel stick does, it right. goes over one color on right. uh, one over another. There's uh, been some conversation, not in all caps, but I still I still read I still read the chat even if it's not uh, directed to me in all caps. And there's been some conversation about pastels with less dust, possibly, or are there brands with less dust? And we do have a comment from um, from Horsewoman 2000 that pan pastels and the pastel pencils maybe have a little bit less dust. Pan pastels. Kind of are, are, are dust, but they stay on the applicator and on the paper pretty well. Is that right, Matt? You've used them. Yeah, they they are uh, they are pretty much the pastel dust uh, in little little cakes, and you lift them up and apply them to the surface with applicators. And because they're already dust, you're basically just blending pastel. I mean, it's it's kind of what you're doing. You're basically mm -hmm. just blending pastel uh, when you apply them. So. For that reason, they're they're naturally going to have a little bit less dust. Um, but I think the surface plays such an important role in how much dust comes up. This is Ganson Mitant's pastel paper, as we already discussed. And it's going to create a moderate amount of dust, but there is a surface called pastel matte paper that really heavily reduces the amount of dust that's produced by the pastels. Now, that's the paper that's almost like a fine sand paper, right? It is, okay. yeah. yeah. And it, it holds the pastel in place on the surface to an amazing degree. It but really, it, it, it does eat it up a lot. I mean, it really accepts a lot of pastels. So right, wear it, them down. it does, yeah. Uh, so I would, if if the pastel dust is really driving you crazy, which I, I can understand that, but, you know, the more you use pastels, the more you kind of get used to it, and it becomes less and less of an issue. Um, I mean, it's something, it's just, it's like a trade-off. It's a trade-off with the medium. It's just, it's just part of it. So, um, but if, if it is a, a real issue for you, then uh, I would suggest trying pastel matte paper. Claire Fontaine is the company that makes that paper. All right. Okay, so I've used a variety of different greens here, and this is a very light yellow green. And as I'm adding this yellow, this light yellow green and these lighter greens, those darker areas appear a little bit darker, but still trying to keep the marks relatively fresh here. All right, let's go into the bird now. And uh, we'll start with 
maybe a darker reddish application here in some of these transition areas where we have some of these darker feathers. And then we'll start layering some of the lighter values on top. Well, you're, you're just looking great. You've got 25 minutes still. Thanks. And thanks for the reminder. <laughs> I, I, you know, there's some, some media and some subjects that just for this particular kind of thing that we're doing here with getting sketchy, where you kind of feel like you've got, you've got the time you're, mm -hmm. you're going to be able to finish it. And then sometimes that breeds a little bit of overconfidence. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I am, I am sorry for the constant blowing again. That is just, just the nature of working nature, horizontal. Right. And I am not breathing the pastel. So, All right. So you can see as I'm layering kind of this earthier, darker red over the top, it's mixing with some of the, the darker browns that we already have in place. We're going to continue to push those values, make them darker and darker as we go through the process. But I think, uh, you know, we're so accustomed to like drawing, a lot of us are anyway, with um, like a pen or a pencil, and uh, we kind of get focused in making marks with precision. And pastels are, you know, they can be used to a high level of precision, but they also can be very soft and loose and painterly. And, uh, that's kind of the approach I'm taking with this particular image. So you don't need to get wrapped up in all the details. You know, these time drawings that we're doing are challenging and they're a lot of, they are fun and we are working from photo references, but this is a great practice for capturing what's essential in a subject quickly. If you're interested in drawing from life and drawing, particularly drawing outdoor from life where the, light is changing and the shadows are changing while you draw. That's a good point. So I would, you know, I would suggest you would in incorporating time drawings into your own practice, um, not just here on getting sketchy, but uh, for, for your own personal artistic journey. Going back to the brown, just making some of the values a little bit darker. Just to clarify, okay. um, Naomi Art asks what kind of surface this is, and this was the Canson Mitant's paper, and you're working on the less less textured side correct that's right all yeah. right then we're about ready to get some real color in here you're working with a pretty limited palette would you say about a dozen colors yeah if even that okay we'll see <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how many it ends up being Right now, it's only about four or five colors. Yeah. And like three of those are the greens. Um, all right. So let's start pushing some of the oranges. Now I'm going to go to a slightly lighter orange here, orange. And we'll just layer that right on top. And I'm trying to think about the strokes that I'm making here so that they flow in the same direction as these little feathers. Yeah, the direction of your strokes, in addition to the value, are describing the form of this bird. So sometimes when you're working with birds or wildlife, um, animals that have fur, it gives us a little bit of an advantage. We can almost, while creating the texture of the animal, we can use that texture almost like contour lines. Yeah, that's very true. It does give you somewhat of an advantage. Because... You know, cross contour lines are one of the most difficult things for people to grasp and understand when it comes to art. I, so I, draw more zebra. That's probably, I get more questions about the, the modules on cross contour lines. Oh, really? And yeah, people have a real difficult time really understanding that concept. And it's so important. But once they get it, it's a real breakthrough yeah, in their for, drawing. Yeah, a lot, and for a lot of people, when, once they get it, they're like, oh, I, I was already doing that anyway. <laughs> and a lot, you know, a lot of people do. They make the cross-contour choice naturally. Right. Without uh, being able to maybe describe or define it in words. Yeah, a little bit of this 
lighter orange here. So you can see we kind of I kind of put in the the base color and then now I'm pushing the value range and extending the depth in the color mm -hmm. by adding additional layers. Let's start working some of this blue in. I'm actually going to switch to a purple now, um, and this is going to be a... Have you already used that purple? I haven't. You know, I was picking up a little bit of purple down in that shadow that There's, you're getting close to. There is some purple the in this. Well, I mean... If you really want to exaggerate things, there's a little bit of purple in here, and that's mm -hmm. what I'm going to do, <laughs> exaggerate yeah. things here. So I'm going to bring in a little bit of this purple here as we start work on the blue sections. We're not finished with the orange ones yet. We're just slowly building things up. And this is another thing that can be difficult for folks, and that's, you know, adding colors that are not completely obvious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that area you're working is probably the dullest area on the bird. I mean, you could make an argument that it's gray, but if you can see a color in it, go ahead and push it into that color. I mean, I, I may even see a little bit of purple on that, on the bark below the bird. Now. Oh yeah, there's definitely it's, some that's where it's at, and it's probably reflecting right up into that those white feathers on the bird's chest. I can't forget about the the bark. I keep keep just uh, we'll keep putting that off right now. Looks All like right, well, uh, you're right developing now. a little secondary color scheme here now. Oh, yeah. I didn't even realize that. But that He said, I don't know why I'm going to grab this purple, and but I I'm going to make a perfect <laughs> secondary color scheme out of it. I always talk about <laughs> incorporating color schemes, and then, then I completely just missed that. <laughs> well, it's my favorite color scheme, so Is it? I couldn't miss it. I've become, I've, uh, become more attracted to the secondary color scheme as well, I get older. I tell you, I think it, I guess it's... It's like a primary color scheme. It takes up, you know, it covers the entire color wheel, but it's not as not quite as common. And Is so, it early spring or early fall? I th it might be spring. Okay, now I'm gonna bring out some blues. Um, I think it's early spring when we start seeing really a lot of those combinations in nature mm -hmm. of uh, secondary colors yeah. around here. Anyway, maybe that's it. Maybe I'm just ready for spring. God, I'm ready for spring. <laughs> okay, so these blues aren't really that obvious, but uh, I really wanted to bring out some of the blues because of the oranges on the on the bird. And still haven't used white or black yet either. I want to point that out too. We're going to. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there's no reason to jump to it at this point. Yeah, they're, white and black are the extremes of the value scales. So you can be careful with them. It's only a little bit of both in life. Unless you turn the lights out. <laughs> All right, let's bring a little bit of that blue right down here, a few marks right over the orange. The pastel matte paper has been getting a lot of support in the chat. Yeah, it really is great. And it's great not just for pastels. It's also great for colored pencils, too, actually. Mm. All right, let's go even a little bit lighter blue here. So we do have a question. I see it's and um, it is from Paula. What does he mean by cross contours or cross contour shading? It's really a direction we're talking about. One of the best ways I could describe it maybe is if you were if you were shading in a forearm and a forearm is is long from the elbow to the wrist, and you would make more strokes or less strokes if you shaded in in the direction that the arm goes from the elbow down to the wrist. It's a lot more work to shade the shorter directions from one side of the forearm over to the other. But in that direction is where we see the change of plane 
where we see the arm change from one side of the arm to the other side of the arm. So by shading, and it's, it's not always in the shorter direction that is correct, but often it is. If you shade in the shorter direction, you have a chance to bend your, your strokes a little bit more to, to indicate that the planes of your subject, and I'm, I'm talking about a forearm right now, that those planes are actually changing direction. You know, if we shade in the longer direction of an arm from elbow to wrist, um, those a single line pretty much travels, or a single stroke pretty much travels along almost the same plane the entire time. And so you don't have a chance to curve that line, and in doing so, show the roundness of the subject, in this case a forearm. Another thing you can do to think of cross contour lines is if you just pick up an apple and like move your finger around the form of the apple and pay attention to how your finger moves around it. Like for example, like how it bends from. Yeah. Here's an example of cross contour lines. And I got to be real careful with this because I'll dump this. Oh out. yeah. Uh, okay. You <laughs> see these lines, these ridges that go along here. Um, well, depending on the tilt of this particular this pencil sharpener, these lines change. You see how they're going back in space here? This might be the, if you were drawing this from this angle, this might be the direction you choose to make your strokes with your pencil or your material. Do you see that? That would be cross contour lines. See, I would choose the other way so you I could, could make go a the other way. Stroke. Yeah, if you went the other way, see, this is not the perfect example because the lines are going this way, but you can imagine if the lines were going this way, they would curve around. Um, I used to actually take a permanent marker and draw on my hand uh, so that the students could see the cross contour lines. Um, I'm looking around to see if I have another good example. I have a cross contour tattoo. <laughs> Do you really? Mm -hmm. um, I use it in the well, classroom. Ashley's going to show us his I use it in the classroom tattoo. as a teaching as a teaching aid. No, I don't. Now, I did have a professor in college that would use a Sharpie and draw in our models sometimes, vertical and horizontal lines across and, a, a, you know, along the model so that we could see how those lines bent and changed. And there's a, there's a lesson there. All right, I'm going to bring in a little bit of a darker gray now. Uh, this is a warmer gray. Actually, it's not that dark as I'm making marks. I'm going to have to make it a little bit darker down here, but uh, a little bit of a warmer gray. Yeah, we're definitely going to have to make that darker. All right, we I got, got another it. question here for you, Matt. And right. uh, we've talked a little bit about it, but uh, just just for clarification, and um, I might have, if I've missed any of Actually, your questions, I, do have a darker I would remind you to put them in all caps just to make sure that I see them, make sure they don't fly by too quickly. But uh, Martin asks, with all of the layering you do, uh, with all the layering, how do you avoid filling the tooth, especially on the smoother side of paper? And I guess you're limited. You know, there is yeah, there is a there is a point where you will get to where the material will not go on the surface anymore, um, and you'll you'll fill it because the material won't it be stops able to, responding. Right, it just kind of shovels um, what's already there around a little bit. Yeah, you get to a point where you just can't push it any further, and um, I'm not to that point yet. And I'm not. I don't really think about it. Uh, I just keep going. And uh, with this particular paper, you're going to have to go pretty far. I mean, this is going to accept lots of applications. Mm -hmm. So it's not something I'm going to worry about with this particular paper, but with like regular drawing paper, I'd, I would have already reached my limit. So I've got a couple of questions that just popped up. Um, Laura Rainbow Dragon asked, did the models get bonus pay for being inked like that? Laura, when I, find out, when I found out how much our models were paid... I was shocked at how little it was. You, but but you honestly, said, oh, I thought you were going to say sign me no. up. I, honestly, um, all they had to do was stand still. But you'd be surprised how hard that is. I think our models. So got I think they well. earned every. I think every cent they got, and they didn't get extra for being drawn on. I think our models got fifty dollars an hour. How much? Fifty. Fifty. Yeah. Dollars an hour. I think our models got paid eight dollars and fifty cents an hour. Oh God, that's terrible. And, and just to clarify, I'm not 100 years older than Matt, and it's not due to inflation. <laughs> <laughs> Aiden asks, what age did you start drawing? How about you, Matt? Um, I, I think I've been drawing since I could hold a, a pencil. Mm -hmm. um, I, there, are, uh, there are images of me um, 
watercolor painting at about four or five years old. So that's what my parents started me with. This is a little bit of black here, so it's going to look strong initially. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm going to bring some purple down here. So my parents started me with watercolor paint because they, they um, you know, rightly thought that that was easy to clean up. And, uh, and, and super easy to master. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, all right, let's 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 start bringing a little bit more warmth and a little bit more form into the bird. So I'm going to switch over to a yellow here. And we're just going to hit a couple of so these areas on paper. Earlier, Matt mentioned that he might annoy some of you with having to blow on his paper. So Brent does art, is um, is bothered by that. So me too, Brent. Okay. But it is uh, it is necessary because it, the paper is horizontal. Yeah. I guess he could pick it up and rattle it, shake it off camera a little bit, but I don't know if that would be any better. Yeah, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> You'll just have to be annoyed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, All right, what it is. See. If the paper gets the tooth filled, um, you can spray workable fixative in that location and get some more texture Take that in mind. That is true. You can use a little bit of workable fixative, and it, it's kind of almost like microscopic glue drops that can add a little bit of, of tooth back on, to, on top of the layers that are there and work out a little bit more. Thank you for that. All right, that's too much. I'm going to bring some more darkness There must here. be some pretty good pastels going on out there because Thomas asks, how do you seal or preserve pastel paintings? His must be a keeper. Um, some people like to put fixative on theirs. I don't. So I just uh, keep a cover sheet on it until it's ready to be framed, and then I frame it behind glass. And, of course, uh, there's a there should be some kind of mat or some kind of, uh, some kind of barrier between the uh, surface of the artwork and the glass. Something so, that keeps it separated. Right. So that could be, you know, a mat. Mm-hmm. And, and I don't mind spraying my pastels and, and charcoal drawings. I spray, usually I use Grum, uh, Grumbacher Final Fixative for that. Real, and I don't overdo it. Two very light coats from about 18 to 24 inches away. All right, we got eight minutes left, so let's bring out some contrast, and then that'll give us a little bit of time to work on this, uh, this uh, branch here. So I'm going to the black now, and uh, I'm going to use this sparingly. But this is going to give us a lot of contrast. It's going to make the colors look brighter, too. Yep. Uh, things are going to start to pop here, hopefully. And this is the new pastel. And you can see how strong that is. Mm-hmm. Actually, it needs to be muted down a little bit. So I'm going to go back to the brown... And just let that mix. Jinxie mentions that they like to use spacers in the frame, and I've seen that before too, spacers that go around the edge that can look nice. Yeah, you just need something that's going to keep the pastel material from touching the glass. All right, let's uh, grab pastel pencil. We're going to go ahead and create a highlight up here with the white pastel pencil, and then we'll go ahead and fill in the eye with the black. So you put your highlight down first because the white wouldn't go over the black well. Right. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be as strong. Mm -hmm. So it's not exactly a circle. And as a result, I got the highlight kind of in a, in the wrong place. <laughs> Needs to be up a little bit higher. Not too big of a deal, but... Gail says she cringes when you don't blow the pastel off. I guess the buildup of pastel all over the paper. She just probably wants to blow it off herself. It's like it's all over her screen. Well, I'm just... I just make people cringe. That's... Yeah. That's what I do around here anyway. <laughs> just, <laughs> everybody cringes. All right, so we'll go ahead and pull out a little bit more of the beak here. 
And let's add a little bit of that yellow in there. Up against that purple. So we've made it to the small marks. We've got six minutes to six minutes to go. Six minutes, huh? All right, let's add a little bit more depth to the talents here. And a little bit more shadow here, just a touch with now, the black. Jenny mentions a fixative that does not darken the color, and I would be interested in trying that brand since that can be one of the drawbacks to I would using too, a fixative. Because that is why I don't use mm -hmm. fixatives. Latour, Sennelier, I may be saying that wrong. Sennelier? Yeah, that's it. I can't see the chat box, yeah, that's I'm, it. I'm guessing. I'll have to try that out. Jenny says it's not cheap. I, that's probably why it works. Make things a little bit darker here, down here on the breasts. And see, this is, I was all confident at the beginning. I was like, I got plenty of time. And now there's... <laughs> and there's always more to do. There's so much more. The farther you get in, the more you see. You know, you open your eyes up and you start seeing those smaller um, nuances of color and value. I mean, you just keep going. This is not a white. This is a... Very light yellow. I think it's not a white. <laughs> kind of looks like one, though, doesn't it? Let's add a little bit more interest to this. There we go. Like that. All right, now we'll, we'll the time remaining, we'll, we'll quickly add some interest down here. There is some purple down here, so we'll add a little bit of purple, and that will tie in the branch to the bird. And our secondary yeah, color there we scheme. Go. So what brand were those pencils that you were just using? Just Carbothello. to clarify. Say it one more time. Carbothello. Okay. Carbothello. A little bit of gray here. Looks like the... Fixative that was mentioned is a little pricey, $22 on Amazon. Uh, I'd say that's, I guess that's about two or three times what I'm used to paying for the Grumbacher. How much did you say? $22. That is a lot. But if it doesn't darken the pastel at all, it'll be, I mean, you know, yeah, if you apply it, I'm sure the way the, the, uh, container recommends it'd be worth it yeah definitely test it out first before so you know um you know at the beginning somebody asked why are you working on the orange paper yeah and why you, how do you make that choice you can see down here at the bottom as i'm adding some of these marks i'm not covering the orange of the paper up completely and i'm not going to cover up the orange of the paper completely um, so some of that paper color is still going to show through all right, we'll drop a little shadow under here. It's pretty subtle on the on the branch or the log or whatever this is. This mm -hmm. is looks like a full on tree. All right, let's pull those talons out. Now I feel like every time I blow on the paper, who was it that's cringing? Well, Brent does art cringes. <laughs> but uh, it also makes some of us feel better to see that dust disappear. <laughs> Katie Speak says, I'm so delighted to finally catch one of these streams. I used to have, I used to be a student of both of you. Well, that's great. That's great, Katie. We're we're glad that you're with us again. Katie we've, used to be a, a student of both of us. We've come full circle. Ah, is Katie a teacher now? I don't know. Well, Katie, maybe are you we'll a find out now. <laughs> maybe. 
Is it the Katie that you're thinking of? I believe so. I wonder if it is. <laughs> okay, the Latour is 1474 at Jerry's and also on Blick. Dick Blick. All right, I got 58 seconds, so I'm going to... Katie used to be Katie James. Oh, okay. I'm so glad to talk to you. I hope, I hope your life's going wonderfully. It's a different Katie than I, than I thought it was, but that's okay. We love all Katies. All Katies are great. Never met a Katie I didn't like, but especially Katie James, who is now Katie Speak. <laughs> all right. Uh, I lost my little... Lost my little piece coming out right here. I'm Uh-oh. Well, you got 23 in. seconds. It's just a suggestion. It's just a suggestion. <laughs> but, you know, I think in this case, it's it's pretty legitimate. Yeah. A pretty legitimate uh, suggestion. So I'm probably going to call this one finished. Yeah, don't either. overwork this, it. I don't want to overwork nice it. It's got a nice feel to it. It's kind of at that point. Mm -hmm. It's kind of at the point where it's saying, Matt, please overwork me. <laughs> Please. Can't you mess up my texture you, just you once? You know you want to keep making marks. <laughs> Don't stop. Keep going. Keep making marks. It's okay. Look at, look at me. I can't stop. All right. I'm going to stop. I know. It's hard. It's hard. All right. Hard to put uh, it down. Time's up. We'll call that one finished. Yeah, that looks great. Nice uh, European robin. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Uh, yeah, there's some things, you know, it's a little bit different in shape. Uh, some of the colors are clearly different, but that's kind of what you want in uh, a pastel image, one that's painterly like this anyway. Um, I would have liked to, you know, looking at it on the screen here, I would have liked to bump up some of the color a little bit more. And looking at it in person, the colors seem a lot brighter than what they look like on the screen. Maybe it's just because of the screen. Um, is dulling the colors a little bit. So when I look at the screen, I, I'm kind of telling myself, I wish I would have bumped up the colors. But then when I look at the image here, I was like, oh, that's really oversaturated. So <laughs> um, somewhere in between seems like it's about right. So, all right. Uh, so there you have it. Let's get some of these pastels out of the way. And uh, we'll wrap things up. Do we have Melody other... says, Matt, it looks great. Uh, thank you. Uh, are there any other questions specifically about this? Mm, let's before? see. I think I've got one here. Can you rub your fingers over it so the background blends, please? Um, I don't know. You could. Yeah. But th there's a there's an issue with that. I mean, blending is, is nice, and it works for some things if you're, you know, depending on the subject that you're doing. But mm -hmm. sometimes it's nice to see colors that contrast each other right next to each other. And even if it's just a subtle contrast, it it's kind of nice. You know, I, I had a professor that would say, my favorite color is a color next to a color that's most like the first. And that didn't make any sense. So he would have to explain it. And what he just really meant was what Matt was talking about, really subtle variances in colors they can be they can be um quiet areas and nice and it actually makes things it, it actually makes things feel more natural sometimes depending on the subject this this makes sense for this subject to not blend the background when we look at the photograph the photograph is so blurry in the background right you know and if if in and if that was it meant goal was a, a full-on copy of the photograph, and I'm sure he'd probably blend that out. But uh, the photograph is the starting place, and the artist's hands, the artist's mark in the... There you go. There's there's one with a this, super soft yeah, background. This is, this is uh, an example of going the other direction. Sure. Now, there's a little tiny spider. And that one was on done that. in 45 minutes, this if you can believe it. This one was 45 that. minutes getting sketchy season <laughs> one. No, just kidding. This is part of the course, Three Little Birds with Colored Pencils, and this drawing was actually created on pastel matte paper, the paper that we were talking yeah. about before. And the background is actually pan pastel. So mm -hmm. I applied this with the applicators and um, gave it that soft look because the image was going to be a little bit sharper and more precise. And then we go back to this one. You can see this image has a different feel associated with it. It's it's definitely more painterly. And a lot of times when you're when you're dealing with an opaque painting medium, like acrylics or oils, sometimes you don't need to blend all the applications because then everything just kind of becomes a, a, a big blur. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, so it really depends on the subject, and it really depends on the look that you're. I trying think that was a great achieve. example, seeing the smoother background and the sharpness of that bird compared to the painterly look of this bird, and then a, a painterly background that kind of corresponds to that. And so, I wish I had a catalog of just everything right here in front of me for that I've drawn or painted, so mm-hmm. I can just pull. <laughs> right in front when that I need it. Sounds just, like a project. Hey, that sounds like a great idea, actually, because yeah. yeah. then I could just pull it up here in Photoshop mm-hmm. and everybody could see it. All right. Well, we'll, we'll <laughs> something for something else for me to work on. <laughs> Get All busy. Right. Uh, was that the last one pertaining to I believe to so. What we're doing yeah, I believe here? so. Okay, we'll go ahead and switch back out over here. Some nice comments on the, on the Blue Jay, also. Oh, awesome. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining us for Getting Sketchy tonight. Next week, it's going to be Ashley's turn. and uh, I'm not sure what I'm drawing. (laughs) I've got four images picked out. I just have to to narrow it down to one. So I can't give you a hint. You'll just have to come right back here next week at 6.30 to find out. So uh, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time uh, will be next Wednesday will be the next live Getting Sketchy. If you are watching this when it's not live, of course, you can watch all the other Getting Sketchy episodes as well and all the other videos that we post on YouTube. Now, for every video we post on YouTube, there are about two or three sometimes that are part of the membership program. So again, there's a link in the description below if you wanna check that out. And there's a link to get three course videos and eBooks for free as well. In fact, it says three course videos and eBooks, but I think it's actually four that you get uh, if you do decide to do that. And subscribe to the channel we have a lot of fun here doing Getting Sketchy and all the other things that we post here on the YouTube channel. There are tons and tons of videos for you to explore on a broad variety of drawing and painting subject matter and materials. We cover every, pretty much every art material you can think of, except for sculpture, really. It's, it's pretty much uh, all drawing and painting all the time around here. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Do a 45-minute sculpture. I don't, I don't know what that would look like, but it'd be a lot of fun. We have seen one-second sculpture before which is just throwing something up into the air <laughs> yes, and taking taking a right. picture of it. So we, we did those one second sculptures. We could do hundreds of one second sculptures on getting sketchy. So. Y- you could. Yeah, but they would be <laughs> They're only exci- terrible. it's only exciting the first time. <laughs> the second one second sculpture is not so much fun. <laughs> but do you remember the one with the water? Who was doing the stuff with the water? You remember that you somebody would lay down or create a shadow and then you'd pour the water in the shape of the shadow? Yeah, I do remember. Do you remember that? It's it's pretty vague. It's it's buried deep inside of my memories, so I'm gonna yeah. have to. Huh. Maybe I that'll... think I remember that day. We were at the School of the Arts, and yeah. I got in trouble for climbing up in the catwalk. Do you remember? I do remember. I, I had up I had there. tied markers to my elbows and knees and <laughs> rolled around on a huge piece of paper to make an action drawing with my body. It's probably the best drawing <laughs> I've ever made. Let's probably bring it here to show you guys. Uh, we were being pretty creative that day, but we were being encouraged <laughs> to be creative. That's right. And I was being adventurous at the same time. I almost killed myself that day by accident. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, thanks again for joining us. Again, in less than 30 minutes, we're going to be over at the virtualinstructor.com. We can draw in another bird. Um, so, <laughs> so we'll see you there, Judith. Yep, we'll see you guys who are members over there in just a few minutes. All right, with that, I'm going to go ahead and sign out for this evening. And Ashley is too. Good night, everybody.